So what I'm going to talk about today is um, something I just brewed in like last one week. And uh, I had a different idea about like what I'll be presenting. I just brewed this presentation in like last one week. And it's something that uh, it's like a personal story. So story time. Let's start with it. OK, one day my co-founder Chuck and uh, I, uh, I basically moved from Singapore uh, to Miami only a year ago. And that was like the first idea that we started working on. And he actually had this crazy idea. I mean, what if we build an app which helps people figure out what's for dinner? And the way we'll do it, it's like, it's like a Tinder-like UI with a Spotify-like interface where you will just left and right swipe food and the algorithm will learn what your taste is and will create a weekly grocery list for you. And it's like super easy and then everybody would be happy because the biggest tension people have is to figure out what's for dinner. So, and the validation that we did, if this is technically viable product or not, is just go to ChatGPT, right? And if ChatGPT can do it, we just need to build a good thin wrapper, a good UX, and people will use it, right? So, uh, that's basically me trying to think, oh yeah, we can do that, and I'm, I'm an awesome CTO, high tech, and I can basically build a really cool, scalable uh, AI thin wrapper. But, and this is how I started. So basically designing prompts around, you are a helpful assistant, uh, help me plan a diet, that didn't work. Help me plan a recipe, that didn't work. And I started having troubles, right? Because every time I'll go to the chat GPT, it will give me a different response. And if you have ever worked with front ends, we need structured JSON, right? And then unstructured JSON coming from chat GPT is not really helpful here. Well, there were solutions around it. Uh, what I first started doing was, interacting and so the first problem that i wanted to solve was like the recipes should be actually legit right uh, a lot of time the structure would be fine but it would give like three tablespoons salt or four cups of uh, milk or something so the quantities were very inconsistent and the food wouldn't make very sense so i talked with a domain expert in this case a chef or a planner and i am working back and forth between uh, talking with the chef or the meal planner and my Jupyter notebook in which I have all the prompts and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. So it's a horrible experience. Takes almost two or three months just to figure out what are the right prompts to actually uh, send something on production. Well, I did figure out that you can actually use something called as chains and then Langchain is a framework around that which helps you build more complex scenarios instead of just writing one prompt and then just sending everything to OpenAI. Uh, well, if you have used Langchain, then this thing breaks a lot, right? Like the documentation around the uh, whole framework is not really good. And uh, if you want to deploy anything on production, it's actually a nightmare because most of the active components are written, written in Python. So you can't actually deploy it on uh, edge or serverless case. You have to like set up a fast API or Flask API and then regularly update in a container scenario. So I'm really terrified and this is not really working out. And in the middle of all this chaos, ChatGPT 4 API came out. And I, all the prompts that were working in 3.5 are not working on ChatGPT 4 anymore, right? So uh, that's a big problem. But my CEO is like, you know what? We'll be, build the best API, build the best AI company. Let's move to this API. But I am like sobbing internally, not able to figure out what should I really do. Um, there were some bunch of Reddit suggestions around use a vector database and cache all the results so that you don't need to go and check the database again and again. I did that. And then I ran into some more problems is that my app would some, sometimes not respond within time. So there is a timeout issue. Sometimes these prompts take too long, like two or three minutes. And in that time, uh, HTTP request times out. So I had to build a built-in queue, like a process queue management to actually do that. But even that didn't work because even if a single prompt fails, that is going to disrupt my entire chain. Okay, well, the way I define this problem is getting started is easy, easy uh, keeping up is hard. And it's not a, that's what she said joke. So we eventually end up building this application, which works, by the way. And you can go on dinnerfy.com. We made it completely free and available for people to use. And the way it works, it, uh, a family gives it likes and dislikes. We convert that into a weekly plan. Uh, and uh, you can send out uh, the order to Instacart in just one click. And that's what brings me to this. Like, what is the solution? What helps us solve this? Or what is something that I can do that doesn't let me go into this spiral 
uh, rabbit hole of figuring out how to build Gen AI applications. And believe it or not, not, not most of us might hate uh, this whole Gen AI wave, but we are being pressurized, right, to build product or at least experiment or do something. We don't want to get left behind. So what's the solution here? So that brings me to today's intro of who I am. My name is Aman Sharma. I'm co-founder and CTO of Lematic.ai. And Lematic.ai is sort of the product that came out of necessity uh, of uh, building such a solution. All the slide materials would be available on my website. Um, and I would love to get into deeper conversations after this presentation. So let's start with like what we already have, right? So we have a DevOps, uh, DevOps cycle, which helps you uh, ship continuously and ship fast. Um, but there are a couple of problems here. I have actually tried to already attempt a solution uh, to make DevOps more accessible to startups and early stage companies using this principle called as Lean DevOps Cycle. And there is another talk that I presented at uh, various DevOps events around uh, how startups can use Lean DevOps Cycles uh, at early stages to build and scale fast. Um, but I think Gen AI is different, like, and bear with me. So the first problem is with Gen AI is that there is a lot of external dependency. Like the main thing, the main core, the LLM or the model is not yours. So you have no control over like what it would respond. And even if uh, OpenAI brands things as 3.5 and upgraded to four, there are so many internal improvements that they are doing, just labeling it as chat GPT-4. So what inferences were working one week ago might not work today. Right, so there is this problem of external dependency, which makes everything a big, big problem, like a black box problem. Then there is a collaboration challenge. It's the first time that you want to work on a technology where it's not just the developers or uh, in a broader perspective, just technical people involved, but you want to have domain experts as well. Uh, you want to have your PMs as well involved because they kind of understand and breathe the problem in and out and they are the best people to tell you like what prompts might work and what, uh, what uh, results are coming good or bad. And then there is a compound effect as well. Any problem or any trace of issue that you leave behind, it's going to com like compound and bite back you. Let's say a small prompt issue that you made, it's going to convert into a big chain issue. Uh, a small uh, bad vector database structure you created, that is going to create a bad vector system and then your rags is not gonna work fine. So you have to be very careful with every step you do because the end application result will be a kind of a, a collective you know, compound effect of all the small, small changes that you are doing to the system. And then everybody's solution is different. Like it's, it's, just, it's just bizarre to me. Like there is one LLM AI company and that is going to be used by every business, every consumer product in the world and it should work, right? I don't know if it's an engineering miracle or not, like that has never happened. Usually we always go with, you know, there are different tools for different customers, but this has the first time like there is a Swiss army knife and everybody is trying to see like, how do we fit that into our product, right? Uh, well, these AI companies offer ent enterprise level support as well, uh, but you know, that's not accessible to a larger audience that, that's here. So we are sort of going with the general notion of like, how can we really make this solution custom fit? And the final one is that the iteration speed matters a lot. Right, you are basically, you don't need to just iterate faster on your product life cycle, but also like you have to catch up with the improvements that are happening outside the world. You have to catch up with what are the production issues, what are the quality issues that your customers are complaining about. So there is a lot of things going on. And if you uh, have a backlog that's like a month long or a two month long, forget about it. You would never be able to catch up to your sprint or a wave that can help you be real time uh, in terms of like whatever changes are happening outside the world. And for those reasons, the DevOps cycle is not really a great solution for this. For example, the first one is that there is not just code, but there are prompts as well, right? So how do you define prompts? So first of all, there is a term prompt engineering, but this thing is not actually used by engineers, used by somebody else. So that's a like, tough battle to do over here. There is no such thing as build because everything is runtime. All these prompts are running in runtime. So you don't build something that is going to perform and exactly behave the same way in production. And then you don't really have a test system. You have something called as evals, which is evaluating like if this results come exactly how I want it. And then there is no such things as internal release cycle because the real release is what OpenAI is releasing. So there is sort of like a mixed complexity of going on here. And that makes it tough to actually implement a DevOps 
kind of scenario in, in this kind of uh, situation. So we need something else, right? Any guesses, what, what, what can we have here? Any solution, any hints? Huh? Multi-agent, okay, we'll come to that point. Fine tuning is a great option as well. Okay, so what I have done is, again, it would be hard for you to guess because there's like so much here. Um, what I've really done is like culminated all the thinking and all the ideas and all the learnings that I had from different uh, sort of like people and different kind of concepts into just one cycle, which I uh, I'm calling the gen op cycle, right? I'm still not fixated on the term. So I, I would love any marketing or copy person coming and forward and giving me a better name for the cycle. And uh, still it's, it's a work in progress, but it's just like a starting point to describe like how gen AI projects uh, can be worked more efficiently and together with different, different people. Okay, so a gen op cycle is basically a six, eight step cycles, or seven. I'm still figuring it out. Uh, so you have plan, you have model, you have workflows, you have evals, you have data, deploy, operate, and observe. And then it just repeats in that cycle. And there is a teeny tiny experiment cycle as well before the full cycle that helps you, you know, deploy applications and test it before you actually deploy them. So we'll go through step by step all these steps and hopefully after the end of this cycle uh, and, and this talk, you'll be able to like not just have a understanding about how to use these Gen AI products to build faster, uh, but also like different, different terminologies and tools uh, that you may or may, may not know uh, in this scheme of things. So the first one is plan. Plan is basically trying to define, this is similar to how DevOps plan also works, what we are actually trying to achieve. It requires basically two stakeholders. You have your PM or the customer. Your customer could be internal person as well or external person as well. And the uh, variables you are really trying to fill in over here is that what is our input? What is the problem input that is coming in? What are the abilities that we want to use from the AI? How can we break down this ability to individual tasks that we want to perform uh, from Gen AI? And then what the final output might look like. Based on these three things, we will make these four first decisions which is operator, interface, data, and model. So inside operator, we need to take a decision whether this is a completely automated system, a semi-automated system, or an assistive system. Then in the interface, are we going to provide a chatbot-like UI? Are we going to give a custom UI? Or we are going to give what now Vercel just recently came with is generative UI, right? Does the UI just like creates itself when the response gets back? Then in terms of data, the data that we are going to give in, as an instruction input is it unstructured, is it structured, or is it like log or statistical data? Then in terms of model, uh, what is the modality, right? Like is it text, video, image, sound? So what, what we are working with here. And how much context length we might need? Is that a long text uh, context problem or a short context problem? And then finally, what are the use case that we have? Do we want open source? Do we want private models? So based on these previous three things, we'll decide basically and sort of like have a first guess on what these decisions might look like. Because making this decision early on is really, really important. If you think that, okay, like let's say you started working on a project and you didn't really figure out like what data we are going to use in that, the end outcome of just plugging in the data is going to be very, very different. So that's an important thing that you need to make before you actually get into the rest of the steps of the cycle. Now, based on uh, the previous things, the first decision we have to make is selecting a model. And uh, a model selection can be based on multiple parameters. Uh, it it's first starts with modality. Is it image, text, video? Uh, we are also getting uh, chat GPT 4.0. I don't know how many of you have heard that news, but it's going into uh, multi-modality inside that same API. Now it can sense videos, images, and sounds within the same API instruction instead of using multiple APIs. Um, yeah, there is a problem of context length, so how much context length we need. There is an issue of privacy. If you are enterprise, you would like to self-host these models. Uh, there's performance issues, uh, quality, and price. So based on all these factors, you would make a decision that what uh, models you might want to use. And uh, in some situations, you might also use multiple models, and that's also a great approach, so that you are very precise with what solution fits where. Uh, there are two tools that I highly recommend. Both of them are open source. Uh, one is the Martian LLM leaderboard. It kind of help you figure out based on your parameters and sort of like evaluations, like what model might work best for your problem. And then there is a uh, Limsys chatbot arena, which is uh, updated every 24 hours. And it gives you like sort of a 
global view of what LLMs are currently performing the best. So that's the step one. Once you have selected a model, uh, this is an optional step, which is we call a fine tuning step as well. And there are two types of fine tuning. One is a full fine tuning, and then the second one is parameter efficient fine tuning. A full uh, fine tuning is a little bit difficult because uh, not every uh, sort of company provides a open source uh, LLMs and then it doesn't provide that fine tuning layers on it. So what we actually work with when we use GPT uh, systems are, these are already fine tuned models. So uh, the uh, fi full fine tuning is not really possible on them. But if you pick up something like an open source model, which also uh, dictates the weights and everything, that could be fine tuned based on our own instructions uh, and our own requirements. So I won't go deeper into this, but that's like the high level TLDR of it. And then uh, PEFT or parameter efficient fine tuning is basically we instruct the system on our own particular use case by giving some kind of examples and then it tunes itself. So the instruct API that ChatGPT gives is kind of what PEFT is being happening on the back end as well. And a lot of open source models supports that layer as well. So once we have uh, the model selected, then we are on to the most important step of the whole cycle, that is creating workflows. And a workflow is basically a three-step process. It's like prompts, chain, and agents. Uh, again, for this step, you would need your product manager to like manage the whole project, but you will also need expert to come in and guide you through the process uh, of like, you know, if, if we are on the right track or not, and obviously developer to code the whole process. So the first one is simple. A prompt is basically an instruction or sort of like a starting string that we give to a Gen AI model and then it start, starts responding back. It's nothing complex, it's usually a one step go solution. Uh, but there is an issue with this, like the context length is a problem here. Also, uh, these LLM systems are prone to sort of uh, lose their track when they get to a certain point. So that's why dealing with long context problem, uh, prompt might not be the best solution. So we jump to the next uh, way of solving this problem, which are called chains. Chains are basically uh, dividing a big problem into small, small chunks. So you can have a big problem where you're just sending data and then LLM is receiving it and then you're getting an output. And what you would do with a chain is basically you break down that into multiple problems and send it to maybe multiple LLMs or the same LLMs, but in different, different endpoints. And the output of one prompt will become input for another prompt. And that helps you achieve flexibility. It's much cheaper to run. It's more accurate. It's more performant and customizable. And then you have agents, which is the most recent sort of uh, dictation in terms of like how we can make these systems more smarter. Uh, agent is ob obviously culmination of chains, but the most uh, differentiating thing for an agent is that it has access to tools. So you can have uh, given your access to your CRM API, or you have given access to your uh, email API or some, some kind of API documentation along with uh, it, it can make choices on in real time. So it can decide based on what the output is coming. It can decide what next step it want to choose. Again, it's a little difficult and it's not really mainstream solution right now, but uh, agents are becoming more and more popular and they are sort of uh, becoming the building blocks of building more smarter Gen AI systems. Uh, Langchain and Autogen again are two open source framework if you are interested in like building uh, your own agent system. Then you have evals. So once you have selected the models and your workflow is there, that you, most of your working prototype is already ready. And now we are going into that cycle of like repeating and testing of seeing like if this results that comes out is the best or not. And to solve this, we have like a triangle of safety, robustness, and correctness. Uh, whenever you uh, like sort of give you, uh, like have a set of input parameters that you're giving to your system, and then based on the output, you are basically judging what is the safety, robustness, and correctness of that system. Safety being like, is it breaking its character? Is it revealing other information? Because you don't want your Gen AI to just start acting as a normal Gen AI system. You only want it to precisely uh, work on your problems uh, and also like not really uh, do any harmful stuff. Uh, you want robustness so that like the responses are always consistent if you are using JSON output. So it should always have those uh, JSON key value pairs and correctness, obviously, the factual information about your responses should be accurate. And this forms our first uh, cycle, which is the experimentation cycle. So based on what your eval outcome is, you kind of circle back to the models workflow evals again and again till you have found out like these are the perfect workflows and these are, these are the perfect set of prompts that will help me launch my product. And these are good enough that I can go to the next step, which is integrating your data. 
So there is an interesting point. A lot of folks integrate data as the first step. Whereas what I feel is like when you are doing evals, you can work out with sample data. Exposing it to a real-time data might become challenging and then you are going to go into other set of issues about how a RAG works, how, how to set up my vector database and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and data is basically how you can give your own data to these systems. And it is divided into three steps again. Uh, so the first one is uh, loading our documents. And this could be done uh, by first of all connecting your source, mapping what fields work, uh, which way, and then converting them into what we call chunks. So a chunks is like individual block of information, and that is what becomes the uh, vectors. And then there is also an overlapping strategy in which we sort of want to provide context in, in both directions. Once our chunks are ready from our data, then we uh, go into using an embedding model, which is converting uh, information into vectors. So you can use open source embedding models, or you can use closed source like uh, OpenAI, and uh, they sort of like do the same thing. The ultimate goal is converting information into semantic uh, vectors, which helps you do cosine similarity and other bunch of stuff. And once you are done with embeddings, you basically store your embeddings and do what we call a document retrieval process. So before uh, uh, you, know, uh, you go to your Gen AI, you're basically finding a context of this information and giving Gen AI or your uh, LLM uh, model sort of a context to answer only from that particular domain. So now you have your data integrated, and now we have the final thing, which is like deploying the system. And that's where you have sort of an overlap between your uh, DevOps cycle and the GenOps cycle as well. So the same DevOps uh, sort of synchronicity you are having with your system, this would overlap here. And those same principles apply in deploying GenOps product as, of, uh, as well, uh, which is uh, having a virgin control system so you can track down what changes were made uh, in your system having it containerized so that you can easily roll back, switch, and have different environments, and most importantly, having feature flag. So if you're releasing a lot of features and then your Gen AI system is sort of like behaving differently, having feature flag and embedded them into your observability system could be a huge, huge help to track down like when things start uh, like changing. So these are the three main practices which comes handy during deployment. And then uh, your product is deployed, and now you're on the operation scale, where you're basically sort of like uh, having these four different scenarios. So the first one is normal response, which is just a person interacting with the application. It's sort of using the same glue code uh, and REST API system, uh, doesn't really need to go to the Gen AI system. So, but then there could be some autonomous response for which it might need to go to a, a Gen AI system and it, it will respond back. So like the order of priority of all these requests should also be this way, just to optimize system efficiency. If no request needs to be, go to, uh, to be sent to Gen AI, this, it doesn't make sense to actually do that. And then automated response comes in handy if you are using Gen AI systems. Uh, but there could be one more step where you are not really sure and you should have this sort of a breakpoint in your Gen AI system where the confidence level, if it doesn't match us really well, you should not just respond back, right? Gen AI systems are sort of prone to always have the sense of responding. And this also is referred as hallucination. Uh, but hallucination in uh, like production system would be really bad because it might give a bad or non-accurate information to your customer. So at that point, you need to have breakpoints in your system, which goes back to the human operator, and it kind of intervenes that this is the right way. That information could be fed back to the, your uh, evaluation cycle as well and sort of used as examples, uh, and then the response is fed back. But always have an open loop between uh, sending the request directly to a human operator as well. And then finally, in terms of observability, this is like the last step because this helps you sort of futurely improve and like further improve your system. And these are like the high level sort of uh, alerts or systems that I have used uh, in our product to sort of optimize that. So the first one is obviously your real time alerts, uh, which sort of helps you figure out how your application is performing in real time. Then have a traditional uptime system for uh, all the systems involved. If you're using multiple LLM model, it might be helpful to monitor these models because they are still uh, not uh, like five nines SLA proof. So you might need to have like a proxy system where it fall backs to other models as well. And then have a performance, which is basically what is the latency of your system? Uh, what is the throughput of your requests and those kind of things? Uh, monitor your cost as well because nobody wants to see a long uh, build from all these models uh, without like, you know, knowing what's going on there. And then uh, the quality benchmarks are still a work in progress in terms of what benchmarks define the quality of the output. Uh, but there is uh, some hallucination benchmarks that are out here, uh, 
which you can use from uh, open source projects like Langfuse. And then obviously you have traces, which is the most important observability matrix. Uh, the ability to basically see in a window and go like what really happened in that scenario is really important here. So you can pinpoint which agent or which chain was responsible for sending a bad prompt. And then just this single property alone can help you launch really improved products. So this is like the whole gen op cycle. And again, it's a work in pro pro progress. It's not perfect. So I would love to get your feedback after the session. Uh, fortunately, I have been given just before the lunch uh, time so that I can extend uh, my feedback sessions. Um, and then finally, uh, just to sum it up, if this was like a little bit over overwhelming, and I know this is like such a detailed topic to go through all these steps one by one could be hard, but this is sort of a TLDR and best practices uh, that I have learned from doing this. So the first one is uh, use the DevOps foundation that's already there, but also add an iterative thinking to it. So how you saw in the gen op cycle, we had experimentation cycle. So break down that step. So sort of this process comes in even as a more broken down process of your DevOps uh, cycle. Uh, plan ahead to avoid potential fit pitfalls. Like uh, sort of Gen AI has this sort of mirage effect in which we are safe to assume that the system will work efficiently just by sending some prompts and we get excited that this is like, will solve our, our company's problem. But there is always that ceiling that comes where the quality just doesn't improve well. So it's really important to uh, plan ahead of time and see if is this ma matching your final requirement that you have for your system to be acceptable. Uh, then have a very set, uh, like you know, collaborative culture. This is the first time that both domain expert and engineers are involved in launching production system. So make sure that all the discussions happens across the teams. Uh, invest in tools, not just get the job done. This is also very important. Like what I learned the hard way is like Python, Jupyter notebooks, and doing that might not be the best setup to actually test your prompts. So there are tools out there. Uh, invest invest in them and make sure like you know you you stay informed and keep improving. So with that, that's about the GenOps cycle. I hope I was able to like, you know, give you something informative today. These are the link to the slides and now let's build. <laughs>